Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. Now, 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 now. Benji said I had to do that noise. Emergency podcast for the worst. I mean, the, the calf to Astana rumor, I didn't know if that was actually going to happen. Uh, we mentioned that in the other podcast, but the worst kept secret in cycling, Primoz Roglic has signed with Bora Hansgrohe for an indeterminate number of years. It's at least two, could be three of one of those two options. And... Uh, there was just a press conference this morning. I mean, press conference is, I think, a bit generous to call this. <laughs> uh, with Ralph Denk and Bora Hansker, i got to say, they. I actually want to talk about that first, Benji. Big signing, right? Yeah. Second biggest signing of Bo- in Bora Hansgrohe's history after Sagan, who was yeah. really, Sagan put them on a map. We'll talk about Bora Hansgrohe's journey in a second. He's just in his hotel. It was a media-only press conference Zoom call. Is this in his hotel room? They didn't even have the, I don't know what the word for it is, the thing you roll up with like the sponsor board behind you. Um, why did they do it today? Like he might, there must be a strategic reason they wanted to do it before Lombardia rather than have it like in a nice suit with all the sponsor boards behind you at a service course next week. Is it a strategic reason or is it because it was starting to leak more than the Titanic when it was sinking? I mean. Why would you? Why would you really care if you were bore if that was the case? And it's already it's already leaked, right? Like it's a hundred percent leaked. So what? I think it's if he wins Lombardia tomorrow, everyone all they talk about is he's going to bore next year. Yeah. Or the, I think maybe it's that, or maybe he's worried there's bigger news on the way next week on Monday or Tuesday uh, as well. So I don't know. I just I thought a little bit. Um, I don't know, a little bit strange, uh, I, but I and can't also, remember the Sagan one. The actual circumstances of the press conference, because we're talking about this, it's an only media press conference, so uh, the journalists and so forth that are on the press list, maybe in the team WhatsApp group, they get like a link to a Zoom call in which they can join where the actual press conference is happening. I would love these to be YouTube live streams in the future if big signings happen. Like in other sports where you've got a major announcement, make it happen on the big screen. Why are teams not doing that? Is it because they wanted to to keep it enclosed just in case to have more control over what comes out eventually? And also, the fact that he was doing it in his in his hotel room, I, I just can't get over that. <laughs> oh, I mean, it doesn't matter in the end. I mean, maybe they just wanted to. But yeah, I agree. It's a little bit, little bit odd. Um... Maybe there's rules against Roglic turning up to the service course in plain clothes mm-hmm. and doing a big photo shoot. Maybe they'll do that next week anyway after Lombardia. But I think it must be they want to have it out there before Lombardia. But yeah, it's the big news. It was first three years, people were saying. Now it may be two years. Uh, the rumored numbers were five and a half, six million sort of range. And that's, that sounds about right to me. Because I, saw, I always see these articles, and obviously now I know a lot of the numbers, but the articles say, ah, you know, X riders on two million. Who's like the best, the second best GC rider in the world? I'm like, the market is expensive now. What yes. Pagacha signed for now is a bargain. He's on rumored six million. Pagacha, if you look at any metric in terms of how efficient his salary is, he's worth ten compared to other riders. He's worth ten. So those numbers sound about right to me. Big investment from Bora Benji. If you were Bora, would you have? Signed a 33 year old Primoz Roglic to, to let's say let's say two years five and a half a year with the buyout s- as well. I swear we've had this discussion for a few years now. Where I think two years ago they had the the Hindley Vlasov signings and so forth, and also the Higita signings where they they signed second tier and third tier GC riders. Hindley ended up winning the Giro, which was kind of an outlier compared yeah. to expectations before the season started. But looking at that, we had the opinion going into that year of okay, they're signing all these second to third year riders, but they may be looking to get out of that, especially after that Giro, to get out of that a rider that might actually end up fighting for the victory at the Tour de France in the future. Because that's the one thing that Alf Denk really still wants to win after winning the Giro, after winning RVV Roubaix with Sagan back in the day. So that's the, that's the big step forward to Tour de France. And that's not really there with Hindley, Vlasov, Kion Eitelbrook's not really either in the current perspective of things. He can grow, he can grow further in the coming years, but we don't know that. So, Primoz Roglic is the first rider on the market, I would reckon, that is not some 
young talent that Machin sna snaps up very, <laughs> very early. Primoz Rogic is the first and the closest thing he's going to get to a Tour de France competitor on the market. Yes, he's 33. Yes, he's expensive. Yes, it's for two years, but I think it's a good idea. I think they have to do it because this never, ever happens. Very, very rarely happens. There's a rider win a Grand Tour in that year, come podium another, win two other World Tour stage races or maybe three, I can't remember. One Burgos, sorry. So two plus Burgos, and they come on the market. It's not like Froome. It's not like yeah. Uh, I don't know. Pick any number of GC riders who won a golden hand. It's maybe a rider of this caliber hitting the market. It just never happens. So if you have the opportunity to do it, because as you said, you mentioned all those names, Benji, Hegita, Vlasov, Martinez. Those three, would you rather have those three for five and a half or Roglic for five and a half? And it's cycling is not often a two plus two plus two plus two equals eight game. Yeah. To win you the two Yeah, to win the tour, you can't just stack pieces that are nice. Yeah. To say it in moneyball terms, you can't replace Roglic by the aggregate of three other riders yeah. and get the same result at the Tour de France. It doesn't work that way. And in addition to that, there's numerous other reasons that I think Roglic would also choose Bora over some other teams. For example, they run on specialized equipment. Let's be honest about it. Some of the better equipment in the peloton. And if he has options compared to Israel, for example, I know for a fact that if he has to include performance in his criteria to select the team, that he's going to choose Bora over Israel in that sense, even though their Giro was good with Derek G and so forth. Time trial equipment and so forth. I'm not overly confident in that sense. And... So that's another factor to it. Yes, money probably helped that it was a big offer and a, a close enough offer to the other big offers on the table to be able to go for that team. But before we dive more into the actual Bora stuff, why do you think he chooses Bora over Ineos? If, let's say, hypothetically, Ineos, yeah, offered. they gave the same offer, hypothetically. I don't think they did. Okay. I, thought, I mean, I don't know, because... I don't know, maybe less competition for GC because of Thomas and Pidcock, but not really because Bora have a recent Grand Tour winner in Hindley. they got Kian wanting opportunities. they got Vlasov in a contract year. I'm not, it can't be that. Team strength, I think, is much of a muchness. I don't know. It might be personal preferences. Ralph Denk has mentioned a number of times that he originally, or he... he wanted to sign Roglic when yeah. he was a Neo Pro. I do love those stories, which like they happen in football a lot, which is like, ah, yeah, I see. I, I knew he was good when he, before Yumbo signed him. It's like, well, but you didn't sign him, so you didn't think he was that good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Vortus had the same story in the tour. He's like, I knew Roglic would be a superstar, but we just we didn't sign him. It's like, well, did you then? Um, so the whole thing about these discovery stories, though, I always feel like the stories are written by the winners of the actual signings. Like, it's always written by the people that end up signing the rider that then tell the story of, oh, we found this rider in that hole at the side of the road and we decided to pick him up because he looked like he had a high VO2 max yeah, from the side yeah. of him. <laughs> we tested him and, oh, he's off the charts. But <laughs> you mentioned, uh, yeah, so I don't know. My guess is Ineos didn't make an offer. It's very strange what's going on there. I heard from a... I heard from people that an Ineos Movistar merger legit could have happened and might happen. I don't know, but that that information is maybe a couple of weeks out of, uh, old now. Yeah. Um. So I don't see it happening in the next nine days. But Ineos, if they don't look like getting Remco, they definitely don't have Roglic because he's going to Bora. Don't know what their plan is. Uh. But back to Bora Hansgrohe and uh, Primoz Roglic. You know, this team started as Team NetApp back in the day, a Conti <laughs> team. They progressed steadily, became a Fro Conti team, uh, sort of a German... Mate. Yes? Leopold Koenig, the man that disappeared, was on this team. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, they just gradually progressed and improved and improved. Yes, they had a German base, but they were already uh, signing foreign riders or riders in the sort of Central European area, typically. And then... Um, they became uh, NetApp Enduro, Bora Argon, and then the big signing, the first year they actually became a World Tour team, did he sign in 2017, uh, was Peter Sagan. So they've done this before. I know Sagan was a little bit younger, but 
I think his years in World Tour are probably the same as Roglic. At that point in his career, he'd done the same years at, at Tinkoff and Liquigas. Also from the same area, prolific winner, the similar area, not the same country, obviously. So they've done this before. And I, I would say the Sagan signing was a major success for Bora. Yeah. Major success. Um, they gave him huge money. I think the sponsors were happy with it because they've re-upped for a number of years. So they've done this dance before. Yes, they're developing Kian, but they sign. They, they, this is their model. Guys have success already in World Tour. Martinez, Hindley, uh, Vlasov, Igita, Martinez, now Roglic, Sagan. They've done this before. So I think, that, I think it'll be fine. But there's one major difference between Sagan and Roglic is that Sagan was 27 when he signed and Roglic is now 33. That being said, Roglic performed close enough to his top capabilities in 2023, in my opinion, to the point that I believe he's not watched for 2024. He can compete for Grand Tours in 2024. Will he be competitive at the Tour de France against Jonas Vingegaard? Perhaps Tade Pogacar and Remco Evenepoel is Remco a bit. I see that happening, but against the other two, I'm like, I'm worried there. But I'd rather see it happen than not see it happen. I'd rather see him try. If the Tour de France started tomorrow, mm -hmm. and say Remco, we don't know where Remco is, Roglic would be the, a favorite to podium, right? You'd have Jonas yep. Polk. 100%. Roglic, third, and there'd be a gap, right? There's a gap to the next person. So you can sign a guy who is the favorite to podium, and you're hoping for better. You're hoping for better. And as, as you said, they've won monuments, they've won the Giro. The next step in the evolution of this team is trying to win the Tour de France. And so swing for the fences, I think they had to do it. And they must have money. They pulled it together pretty quick, smart. I don't know. They said, I think it wasn't from Red Bull. Like Red Bull didn't chip in extra. Mm -hmm. So they obviously got the money, even with signing Martinez, Serrero, Wellsford uh, to the team this year. So... Obviously, Bora and Hansgrohe are chipping in a fair amount. Uh, before we actually analyze their team structure, mm -hmm. Benji, to support Roglic, is there anything else from... Uh, like, did Roglic have to do this? You've already mentioned you'd like to see it. I think as neutrals, it is fantastic that one of the two big leaders at Yumbo, no offense to GC Coos, is going to another team. Is this, does this give Roglic a higher chance to win the Tour? It's a good question. As in... If you arrive at the Tour de France as a second leader next to Jonas Vingegaard, you've got a chance of winning the race. We saw Kuz arriving as third leader, even maybe not pre-announced third leader, but third leader in the race at the Vuelta, winning the Vuelta. The Tour is kind of different, though, where they might not try that out in that sense. But I would say that it still gives a solid chance to, to Roglic to win in the shadow of Vingegaard in that sense. But on the other hand, I think he'd much rather try to win the Tour de France, knowing that everything is under control by him. The fact that he's got his own team that rides for him completely, hopefully for him, and arrives at that Tour de France, and that whatever happens, it happens because he was the strongest or not the strongest rider. Because otherwise, you've got situations where, oh, a teammate is up the road, he's also a co-leader, I can't ride now. And based on the Vuelta, Roglic does not like that situation. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Um, I think Denk also mentioned he can be a mentor for Kian Oterbrooks. If Oterbrooks stays. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> or <laughs> Vlasov, is he... They never say their contract lengths. I'm trying to see. Vlasov's out of contract, I'm pretty sure. I don't know about Hindley. They might have silently extended him. But yeah, I think there's a lot of guys out of contract, like those two I just mentioned, who and Kian... If you're going to ask them to be a domestique in the tour, that's, I think, a difficult conversation. But is, are we overrating Bora? They currently sit, think so. They sit 10th in the UCI ranking, according to Roll's last article. Yes, but their riders are also the riders that can't win the races, in the sense of like... Uh, yeah, but you get points for being competitive. You do, that's true. That's true. I, Lotto I feel like are we, ahead of them. Well, Lotto's also like... They're farming. Sniping all the small, ra small races. We've got Arnaud Ali that's destroying okay. races like Group Quebec. Group so. FDJ have more world points I in agree. World Tour competition this year than Bora. I agree that should not be the case if you've got Bora with this team. And let's, let's analyze the team. Like you said, you said Vlazov, you said Hindley, you said Kion. 
if I see Keon and let's say he stays at the team for 2024, that seems to be the case. Then he arrives at the team and I say he can ride a Giro because that parkour probably fits him better than the Vuelta, for yeah. example. And I don't feel like he's ready to go to the Tour de France. So crisis averted. <laughs> Number one, Vlasov, that's a difficult one. He Hinley, that's leave. a difficult one. It's about those two riders, whether they are willing to work for Roglic or not. Because if they go to the Tour de France, they should be domestiques, in my opinion, for Roglic. Hindley would be a, an Adam Yates-like super domestique, I would reckon. Yeah, for sure. Vlasov would be a rider just before that, if he wants to. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take Vlasov to the Tour de France. I probably wouldn't okay. extend him either. Um, because he just, he just doesn't seem to, he's just not quite good enough. I don't know what they're paying him, but he, they signed him off that Astana year where he was flying. Yeah. Uh, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't uh, extend him, but uh, it depends on the money. If he, if he's a good teammate and he signs for the same money, then maybe you do. I don't, I don't know. It depends on the money, of course. But as you said, like, let's, let's try and construct a team around Roglic Benjik because they just signed Martinez. Yes. They've got Higita in. That's been a bit of a disaster this year, I think. The <laughs> Higita signing. Yeah. Uh, Martinez, I heard, is on good money. Like, <laughs> like multiple millions. Maybe I'm, maybe that was wrong, but um, they got Martinez in. What team are you constructing? Because Denk was asked, uh, according to Freeb, Denk was asked, oh, what about the flat support? You just lost Niels Pollitt to UAE Team Emirates. Uh, the flat support's looking a bit thin on the ground. I agree. So first person I would have is Hindley. Yep. That the tour was Roglic. Hindley's got... Because Roglic needs someone like Koos. He needs like a top, top Correct. climber who on certain days actually climbs better than him. And I think yeah. Hindley is that guy. Um, who and else you got? Martinez is also in that team for me. He's that supportive guy that was supportive for Bernal, but can also be the rider that also supports just before Hindley does. And a sprint and lead out, like an uphill sprint lead out, is quite good. Exactly. Now, I quickly want to jump towards the rulers because then we can fill in the middle part of the team. I think Kamna in the team is also a rider that can be part yeah, of that Kamna train. Kamna picked good himself. Domestic. Exactly. But when it comes to the, the rulers, yes, Paulet is a big loss. I do feel like Huller is a solid rider to fill in a role like that. Dens as well. So I see two potential options there. Are they individually as good as Paulet as a ruler rider? Might not. They're not super far off, but they're not on the same level. I, um, I see those two riders in the team. And then the question is, we've now got one... Roglic, two, Roglic three, Hindley, Jungles, Kamner, Haller, Dens, seven. Martinez. Seven. We need one more, right? Mullen, probably. I don't do know. It. I feel like that's too much. But you got Kamner, Martinez, Hindley is pretty good in the mountains. Jungles is then the Benote role. Yeah, but Jungles can also take up the ruler role when necessary. So he's already that two and a half ruler. Yeah, rider. but Dens cannot do a sprint. Cannot, he, the guy cannot yeah. do a sprint lead out yeah. or the 3K and you, all you got then is Haller. Yeah. Uh, th the problem is these guys can't climb. Haller, Mullen, they can't climb. So, And I'm, I'm talking like a 3K, 6% roller. So Sobrero? I'm not completely sold. I mean, jeez. <laughs> You had to drink as a consequence of me saying that. <laughs> There's Gamper. Oh, Patrick Gamper. Um, who's the other guy they just extended? Frederick Vandal? Is he like a... He oh, was he... good at, when it comes to the climbing at... Was it the uh, Algarve race two years ago, one year ago? Where Von Wilder won? Was that this year or was it last year? You know who would have been good? Schelling. Yep. Uh, but he's off to Astana. So... The climbing, I think, is really good to have a former Grand Tour winner if he wants to do it. Uh, I wonder what Hindley thinks about all this. Uh, maybe they'll have him as co-leader, but you got, yeah, Kamner, Martinez, Hindley. On paper, that's fine. In the medium mountains, breakaway satellite riders, Jungles, Kamner. Also, I think that's pretty good stuff. But yeah, Haller, Dens, and whoever. And I think, especially because Roglic needs that help, 
in sprint in sprint finishes. Like he really needs his handheld. Um, uh, maybe it's Mullen, but yeah, I think it's. But it's not. It's certainly not as good as Yumbo's ruler squad. We spoke about building the team now. I also feel like there's a consequence that comes with signing Roglic for some other riders. As in, we spoke about the GC riders like Ikeon potentially doing the Giro, but Roglic will go to the Tour de France and will want the team fully in support of him. That means that Sam Wellsford for the entirety of his career at Bora will likely not start the Tour de France. And on the other hand, I do feel like he hasn't shown himself at the top level because DSM's lead out wasn't great, but he also didn't step up on the, on the World Tour Grand Tour stages. He beat big sprinters at San Juan and so forth. But I want to see that at the highest level, in the biggest leadouts and so forth. So maybe in one week races we see that first, but if he delivers in that, which I believe with Van Poppel and so forth, if he starts doing a victory at UAE Tour here and there, then I'll start to feel like, okay, maybe Wellsford will become the one that will be held back by Bora. Yeah, maybe. If he was thinking he was doing the Tour, that won't be the case anymore, but Bora Hansgrohe are their favourite. I mean, at least he knows now in October. Normally, the Bora Hansgrohe sprinter finds out on about June 20th <laughs> that they're not doing the Tour de France, if you look at Ackerman yeah. and Bennett the last eight years. So uh, <laughs> at least he knows now he's probably not doing the Tour de France. Uh, I forgot Jonas Koch, 30, decent ruler. He might be, Jonas Koch might be the guy, but it, it's not Van Hooydonk, Laporte, Van Aert, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but then again, that's the risk Roglic is taking. He wants unfettered leadership and, you know, changing team has pluses and minuses. We've left out the, the original German core, Benji, of Buchmann and Schachmann. I guess they just, I just don't see well, a place. Like, maybe Buchmann replaces Martinez if Martinez is no good, but... Yeah. Um, yeah. The thing with Buchmann is that every time I see him in a race, I have complete doubts on whether he will support his leader or not, because half of the time he does and half of the time he doesn't. And I don't know what the reasoning is in the moments he doesn't versus when he does. But it happens like that. And like, Shockman is kind of like, I don't want to say it, but kind of watched at the moment. Yeah, he's still under 30, but you're right. He, you know, he was in the top sort of 20 riders in the world in 2019, 2020, and really, really struggled the last couple of years. Only 175 UCI points this year and 44 race days. So yeah, he's really, really struggled to get back to that that shape of 2020 and 2021. I don't know what happened there, maybe sickness or something, but what was I going to say? Forgot what I was going to say. Can't have been too important, I'm guessing. <laughs> maybe you bring Van Poppel or, or something like that um, to do that. Uh, maybe other guys, young guys, improve like Lubavitz. Maybe Karen Oterbrooks wants to be, is happy to be a domestique side by side with, uh, with Roglic. And... Does that mean then that we see, you think uh, Vlasov and Kian at the Giro? Or Kian definitely does, does the Giro now? I think Kian does the Giro. Vlasov don't really care where he lands. I think putting Vlasov and Kian in, in the Giro will be like torturing both of them again. <laughs> but um, maybe Vlasov Vuelta. But I, I reckon Roglic does two of Vuelta combination anyway. So Yeah. Does he I do the know. Arden? He has to be their Arden leader too. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I mean, I remember what I was going to say. Uh, Roglic, we, we thought about Bora Hansgrohe and Ineos tactically. You know, you look at the Tour de France, Hinley on stage five was really, really impressive. Let that yeah. not be forgotten. That, yes, I mentioned. Let's not overrate Bora. They are tenth in the UCI ranking as of a couple of weeks ago after the Vuelta, behind a lot of teams you'd be surprised by. That might be more to do with their classics lack of success recently, and Shackman and Co. in the Ardennes. But in terms of GC stage racing, they're the last non UAE, non Quick Step, non Remco, non Yumbo team to win a Grand Tour. Yep. Tour 2022, not that long ago. And tactically, they're strong. Yeah, they try things. They try things. They use. They get satellite riders. They attack specific stages. They really go for it. Um, I don't know if that was the plan with Hindley, but they got multiple riders in with Hindley on stage five, taking the stage. And Yellow was just really, really impressive the way they did that. And I do think Hindley would have finished much better 
in the tour had he not crashed. I really think that yep. crash made a, a really big difference and he was better than his seventh, I think top five. Uh, but he did crash. But I think, yeah, the the difficulty with Roglic is Benji, he doesn't... Yeah, I think Pollitt's a big loss. I really do. Because I, I don't think Roglic actually does want to do what Hinley did. Those sort of things. Um, yeah. Or the... The, the Torino Kelderman raid in the Giro, I think they're actually, he needs more of a closed race. So that's why he needs a strong team. But yeah, I'm keen to see how they'll make it work. Um, it's definitely, is there anything else, I guess, in team construction, Benji, that I'm missing, like a Sobrero or um, who will partner with at Bora? I don't know. I feel like we, we got the gist of it. The more I think about the Paulette laws, the more I think about that I agree with the fact that maybe Mullen really fits in that in that team as a consequence of the of the preparation for sprints for Roglic because that's an area where I'm where I'm scared he might just crash out. Yeah, yeah. He, the reason Roglic looks so good this year in the Vuelta is he didn't crash seriously. He had that one touchdown in the wet in Catalonia with Milano, but otherwise he didn't crash. He, and he, he crashes in like fifty percent of his races, uh, his Grand Tours. So, and you remember, Mul mem mem remember Pollard Benji. Yeah. The stage 12, where the break formation lasted in the tour, where the break formation lasted two thirds of the stage, and Pollock was jumping, and it was like from a group of 20, it was like the Iswar maybe stage, really yeah. hilly. Look, I know Iswar. Izagir, I think, won it. Yeah. Pollock was fucking good. Maybe not the smartest thing he was doing, but I was like, wow, he's still here. And yeah. there was no other Bora riders except for him and Hindley. And that's why I think it is a big loss because Mullen and and Popple and Cock, they, they can't do that. And that's why it's a good sign for UAE. It's a big loss, but it's also something that I don't see in Bora's control. If if UAE really yeah. wants Bullet, they will outbid Bora for Bullet. And they really needed Bullet on UAE's side. So I think I'm happy for Bullet that it's getting the bag. I hope that it benefits UAE in the breakaway formation. And I hope that the other boys at Bora can replace Bullet's role as much as possible. Is there anyone else that... Bora Hansgrohe can sign now that it's 6 October uh, to that they really need. I guess Kasper Asgren. Like, are they just waiting to see what happens with the Sudal, Quickstep, Jumbo, Visma uh, news? Because they have a couple of roster spots, maybe three roster spots left. Who, who have they got to sign? Like, Nelson Oliveira, in theory, is out of contract, but. I think he probably signed with Movistar and they just haven't announced it yet. What would you do if you were them? Oh, I find it hard. Like the entire market is kind of frozen on the yeah. quick step, on the quick step stuff. We haven't figured out what Movistar and Ineos are, are plotting behind the scenes. It's, it's such an interesting, but very weird transfer season to the point that the mystery can stop soon. Come on. I yeah, need to fucking know tedious. what's happening. <laughs> hopefully it's announced hopefully we find out more information next monday tuesday yeah. and if it's tedious for us then you can can you imagine being the a the rider. riders involved you know Stop. so exactly um but yeah if they knew they were signing roglic would they have gotten de clerk because little trek got him that's what i would also because it happened so late roglic becoming available but maybe they try to bolster the squad with extra guys like maybe i don't know david de la cruz um. Yeah, like Castro in theory as well is on the market. Jonathan Castro Viejo at Ineos, but um, we'll I wouldn't see. let I wouldn't let him go if I was Ineos. He's too good. Yeah, I think so as well. And like we we spoke about Ineos a little bit here, them missing out on Roglic. If they would also miss out on Remco, then they just lost the opportunity of a lifetime to already have a GC leader again. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Two of the best GC, two of the best four GC guys, whichever way you look at it, hitting the market and you get neither of the two. I guess they do have a lot of money committed to to Pidcock and probably now Rodriguez and and other other riders. But yeah, it's I definitely think there is budget contraction at Ineos. Um yeah. I think G literally said that in his podcast that we don't have as big a budget as we used to, where it was a bit carte blanche, but they are still giving a lot of money to riders who aren't as good as Remco or Roglic. So, <laughs> so yep. it's yeah, a bit of a catch-22. I don't know what's happening there. Um, it's also just, I find Ineos a rather 
unattractive team to join unless you're like a very young rider. Why? I don't like their tactics. Very traditional. I see the hierarchy in the I just team did and the I see I just that... Did a, I had to do some work. I've been doing a lot of work this year week and went and watched the whole Giro again. They didn't do anything for three weeks. They did not do a single thing to try and win the race. Yeah. It was, of course, it's now in hindsight, but I was watching these stages, Benji. Bondone, for example, they had a satellite rider too. Yeah. UAE had Ulysses. They had, I don't know, Swift. If UAE hadn't paced, they would have paced at five and a half watts per kilo and come in in a group. Yep. And Roglic wins the sprint. And I know Sivakov crashed out, but I was watching, and then I watched the Trey Chimi stage, and I was like, it, do you know how big the group was on Paso Jao when Puccio, Puccio paced the top of Paso Jao? Yep. It was a group of 50. After and also, like, additionally, next to that, I, I disagree that it's fully hindsight because I swear you were saying the same evening of Monte Bondoni that Ineos lost the chance by not pushing harder on a stage like that or some other stages. Oh, and Trey Chimi, as well. I, I, Trey Chimi, I could not believe it in real time. I could yeah. not believe it. Yeah, because, like, I'm still of the opinion that they could have come very close to winning the Giro if not actually won the Giro if their tactics were better. Because, like... We've mentioned this loads of times, but Roglic at the start of the season had weakness on races that were harder, longer and harder. And that was not used by any else to try and win that race necessarily. So either they didn't analyze the races before of Roglic or they didn't act on it. Roglic, right? Bondone. Bruno Armorel hit the base of that climb nearly 5,000 kilojoules. That stage was brutal. And then Yumbo yep. lit it up with Dennis and Hessman. And then UA smashed it with Vine, right? Roglic gets dropped. Koi, stage 18, two 20-minute climbs. Still quite attritional, but it's more of a welter stage. Roglic looks really good. That doesn't mean on Trey Chimi stage, on Paso Jao, he's going to be good again. Yeah. Like, you have to look at the different parkour, man, and say, okay, this is like Bondane, but also even harder if they wanted to win the Giro, you got to risk a little bit. And you got uh, Paso Jao is clear they should have smashed the one before where Cavendish was in the group at the base of Paso Jao. And there was a, like an HC climb before. And De Plus and Aronsman had to launch G on uh, Paso Jao. But... Sorry, that was a long rant. I just had it in me. But um... yeah. So tactically, yeah. we're not the proudest of what Enios has achieved this year. Also, when it comes to the hierarchy in the team, the fact that in that Vuelta stage, Ghana was riding all out for Thomas, that seems to me that they didn't understand what their riders were capable of on a parkour like that. But also that Thomas is the all-out leader in a stage like that because Thomas is the all-out leader at the race. And I don't like that. I feel like you should apply your strengths where possible, especially if the leader is not a GC rider anymore. And there's also other things where I feel like the fact that riders are leaving Ineos to have more opportunities elsewhere also shines to me that if you're like a 26-year-old and you're signing for Ineos, you probably won't be getting those opportunities in the first place. Unless you're like big, but also that, that's, a, that's from a different perspective than Roglic though, eh? Because Roglic would be leader if he joins, right? Yeah, I think so. But yeah, I'm not sure how it would have worked with, with like G and Roglic together or... Maybe Rodriguez would have been the, the super domestique and then G does the Giro again. I'm not sure. I think it would have Mate, worked. They need, they need wins. Roglic would have loved having Pitcock in the team at the Tour de France. <laughs> I that's don't think it. so. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, like Roglic wants everybody around him doing, um, you know, like you, if you watch the Giro, compare the Giro, how Yumba rode the Giro to the Tour. It's very different, isn't it? Um, yeah. So... Yeah, I think I don't think Ineos really went that hard. Maybe they thought it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit the way they're trying to ride, which also that's fine too. Um, but maybe Israel, Israel were the ones bidding up, bidding up Roglic. Um, also, I, I feel like I constantly hear things about kind of like, it feels like within Ineos, there's always a bit of like um, intensity, some stress, some something going on. Does that make sense? Well, I know I feel like a few, every time a, a I hear about staff Ineos, left. yeah, every time I hear about Ineos, I feel like there's always some drama internally going on. 
Oh, I mean, Yumbo just had <laughs> yeah, okay, to add trauma. I'm doing a Robert leading Yumbo <laughs> podcast to go to Bora Hansgross. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of uh, yeah. Uh, but I think that happens in a lot of top teams, top athletes. But yeah, I, I think you're right though. Like maybe not everybody gets on. It's, it is interesting how they've got like the Hispanophone section of the team. Yeah, and the you know old sky or the english guy anglophonic anglophone section of the team and i'm not just making that up g said in the vuelta or they were previewing the vuelta and he's like oh castro's going or whoever the tour made the tour castro's going but you know for the camaraderie castro and frailer they don't really lead the team because they're you know because they're like you need you need row or somebody I, i'm misremembering but it just basically made me think that there are there are definitely two camps um yeah. I'm not saying they don't peacefully coexist. I think Castro is the best teammate in the world. Yeah. I would have won him on any team, and yeah. Frailer too. I'm just saying it's it's funny how they got two camps now. Ah, uh, but kind of straight into a different path. Uh, maybe maybe tomorrow, Keanu to Brooks announces he's going to Ineos Grenadiers. Mate, do you think? Do you think they should go for him for 25? I don't know yet. I want to see the next season before I. Oh, if I was in your they can go. start the conversation. Yeah, but it's too late. You can't if he. You can't wait for him to podium the Giro. No, you, you can start the conversation. Pretend you're interested, and then during the Giro, sign him if you see actual boom. If I was in your side, go for him. There's okay. no better time because he's gonna. You might get him cheap because he's kind of dissatisfied with probably really? Chinli Vlasov, maybe. So, like I, I saw a rumor on Twitter today about Charles Marceau that. There's some interest of him going to Groupama or something. I, I'm not sure I believe the story of him Again? going. <laughs> the, the thing about the story is that, like, imagine not coexisting with, not being able to coexist with Vlazov at the Vuelta and then going to Groupama to coexist with Godu. <laughs> Dude, the majority of what that guy writes on Twitter is fiction that he makes up and then says he's his own source. So, um, I mean, maybe Khan wants to go to FDJ. I guess he speaks French, but uh, I don't think so. It wouldn't be the best. Oh, I, I do want to fight back a bit. I feel like his reporting on the BNB thing was really good. That guy's a clown. <laughs> Charles Marceau. Anyway, um, that's all from us today. Maybe there's more uh, transfer news in the coming week. I, I guess there will be. Uh, there has to be some resolution to the merger or lack of merger with Yumbo and uh, Sudar Quickstep. Hope you enjoyed the Rollish pod. Let us know. Is he winning the tour next year? Was it the right idea? Should Bora have done it? I think uh, we said mostly yes in the affirmative. But hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you with the uh, with the Lombardi recap tomorrow. Ciao.